to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade, and today I'm joined by Colonel Stuart Rubio. Good morning, sir. How are you doing today? Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to discuss this. Absolutely. This is an excellent opportunity for us to have a conversation around commander responsibilities and further our understanding of what it means to be a commander and listen to the unique perspective that you have because you've been a squadron commander, but you are also a current wing commander. Is that correct? That is true. I've actually hit commands at the three levels at the squadron, the group and the wing. And I've done it in a relatively odd succession, pretty much back to back to back. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) okay. Well, yeah, let's hear about your experience. Give the audience an idea of who you are, where you come from, how you got into the Air Force, what your experience has been along your career, how you've managed to survive back to back to back command tours and arrived up to this point. Sure. Started my career at the Air Force Academy. I'm a class of 1998 graduates, the dominating class of 98. My wife is actually a 97 grad. Okay. So she preceded me by a year. And from there, I went to pilot training at Laughlin. And as a previous commander has said, I also was selected to do some additional time uh, at Laughlin. So I spent a good four and a half (laughs) years there as I was a T1 FAPE at Laughlin. And from there, basically since then, I've been a TAC airlifter. I went into the C-130 community. Okay. Went to Little Rock Air Force Base, both on the AMC side for three years, did a few deployments to Southwest Asia as a TAC Mm -hmm. airlifter, and then uh, slid over for another three years as a instructor pilot in the schoolhouse there in the C-130J model, the newest model, the C-130. From there, we're lucky enough to get stationed at Ramstein, had three amazing years in Germany and took full advantage of that. And then I had to pay my penance and went to the Pentagon uh, from there. A <laughs> uh, little bit of an odd assignment as a ops guy. I was actually in A1. I did rated policy there. Oh, okay. So I was implanted into A1 and got a good breadth of experience there. Yeah, I'm sure that perspective has been very useful as you've come into command and manpower has become a very important aspect of your job. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. And then from there, I was pulled back to the schoolhouse at Little Rock to be the DO of the squadron. And and then at that point was pulled to command. And my command was a little odd in that I was pulled into a reserve wing. So I was still an active duty member, but was in command of a, a reserve squadron, the 815th Airlift Squadron here at Keesler. At that point, while I was in command, I actually hit my 20 years. Okay. And retired from active duty and took advantage of a program called the Indispensability Program, where retirees can come on as a reservist. Generally, I think it's there for members who have retired. And after a few years, they miss it so much. If there is a need <laughs> within the reserve, they can get back in. For me, I had learned about it while I was still in active duty. I was obviously I was within a reserve wing. So I took advantage of it immediately. I spent about a month and a half as a civilian and then rolled right back into my same job as a reservist. How long did your beard get in that month and a half? (laughs) It was impressive. Yes, Uh, that is exactly (laughs) what I did. My retirement ceremony was in that time period. So that was the only reason that I shaved during that time, (laughs) uh, which my wife was very thankful for that ceremony to hit. Uh, Oh, really? Okay. Oh, she likes you clean shaven. Okay, I get it. Yes, yes. So I came in as a part-time reservist initially, and now I'm uh, what's called an art air reserve technician. So Mm -hmm. I'm a dual status uh, military and civilian, but I serve in a full-time role here. So I did another year as a squadron commander. So I did a full three and a half years as a squadron commander, which is longer than what we see generally on active duty. It's a two-year gig. And then transitioned to be the deputy ops group commander for about six months and then took command of the 403rd operations group. 
So here we've got that tactical airlift squadron. We also have the hurricane hunters, the weather reconnaissance squadron, yep. and then air medical evacuation as well here. So I did that for about a year and a half. And then our wing commander was pulled to another wing of need. So I was tapped to go ahead and fleet up again. And with about a month or two of notice, took command of the 403rd wing. So by the time I'm done with this job, I'll have commanded for seven out of seven and a half years. It's been a run for sure. Oh, absolutely. But what impresses me the most, not just your path to get there and your ability to maintain your sanity over the course of those seven and a half years, but sir, you don't have a single gray hair on your head. How did you manage that? Um, I, I do feel like by the end of this time, it'll be that transition that you see presidents go through when you see the before picture and the after picture. I think it'll definitely they'll be there by the end. Awesome. Well, you know, I'm a fan of gray hair. Not, <laughs> you know, not that I have much choice about it, but great. So thanks for the introduction. The purpose of us being here today is to revisit the episode that we did a couple of years back about improving the unit but offering some commentary on the back end from the commander perspective. And looking at your bio, your resume here, you've been in command for a long time. You've been in the Air Force for a long time. You've had a lot of opportunity to improve units and see units be improved by others, correct? Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So we can rely on your expertise, your experience, as we cut here now to the rebroadcast of that episode, and we'll see you all on the backside again for that commentary. All right, so we'll cut there to the episode. We are continuing our discussion about what the Air Force values in its Air Force officers. We've covered executing the mission, leading airmen, and managing resources. And today, we're moving on to the fourth and final value as described by General Goldfein in his memo and also in AFI 1-2 3.4. This is how an officer contributes to improving his or her unit. From AFI 1-2 3.4, it says, continuous process improvement is a hallmark of highly successful organizations. Wasteful, ineffective, or unsafe ways of doing business cannot be tolerated. Officers must foster a culture of innovation and challenge inefficiencies. Now, Reed, this is an interesting topic of discussion, especially given what's going on in our Air Force right now and actually where the Air Force came from to begin with. Now, the Air Force is an organization that was born from and raised in a culture of innovation the reality is that the Air Force wouldn't exist at all if people like Billy Mitchell, Hap Arnold, and Curtis LeMay weren't continuously trying to improve upon things, if they weren't trying to foster that culture of innovation. It's this culture of innovation that has very recently given birth to now the, the Space Force as the sixth branch of the military of the armed forces. And I feel like this has been an especially big topic that has continuously come up over and over again uh, while I've been in the Air Force. I don't know how you feel about it. It definitely has picked up very recently and to the tune of actual allocation of money. That's kind of when you know it's serious is when it's not just something that we hand wave, but we actually put dollars behind it. I don't know if you guys have any of these or access to them, but squadron innovation funds. Have you heard of these SIF funds? Yeah, I've seen a few different ways that those squadron innovation funds have been implemented. Yeah, so down to the most fundamental unit of the Air Force, the squadron, funds are allocated and designated specifically to allow and encourage and in many ways foster this idea of innovation. It does seem that it has picked up lately. Yeah, and in addition to those squadron innovation funds, there are a huge number of other programs and other special duty opportunities and TDYs that airmen, including officers, can go on and take advantage of in order to become better innovators themselves or to help their airmen develop that culture of innovation. In no particular order, here is just a taste of some of the programs that the Air Force currently has going that are focused in on this idea of innovation. Airmen powered by innovation, AFWorks and the Spark Tank, Kessel Run, Education with Industry, National Security Innovation Network, National Science Foundation Innovation Corps, and the Air Force Fellows. So in addition to those different programs and special duty opportunities, there are actual 
units and installations within the Air Force whose primary mission is innovation. First and foremost, Air Force Materiel Command. There's a major command whose entire job, its only mission, is to innovate and make the Air Force better. Other units, the Air Force Research Lab, the primary lab itself in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but other labs that are sprinkled throughout the United States, the Life Cycle Management Center, the Installation and Mission Support Center, the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies at Maxwell Air Force Base, part of the Air University, Edwards Air Force Base, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Kirtland Air Force Base, Eglin Air Force Base, all of these different units, installations, these programs, these TDYs, all of them are part of this idea of innovation and ultimately improving the unit down at the squadron level. Now, certainly this is not an exhaustive list and each of these different programs, units and installations deserve their own episode. Maybe that's something that we can look into bringing some experts on and talking about how each of these different programs work, especially as they relate to the training and development of our Air Force officers. But the main point here is to show how seriously the Air Force takes this whole culture of innovation. Now, Reed, it's great to know that the Air Force really takes this seriously and is putting large amounts of money into the idea of innovation. But I think we need to better understand what is truly meant by you know, these buzzwords. And that's really what they are, is buzzwords. What is meant by these buzzwords, culture of innovation and continuous process improvement? What are we talking about when we say improve the unit? What are we looking for? Yeah, no, I think we absolutely do because I'll admit this is something that despite its growth, and I do recognize the importance of innovation, I really do. It has gotten to a point where it has start to become a little bit cliche and a little bit trite and almost frustrating. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit here about some experiences I've had that have kind of led me to that point where sometimes change just seemed like it was change for change's sake. But I do think there are some things we can talk about, especially in like the perspective that an officer should bring to a unit, the attitude they must have. And something we absolutely trained to and trained for and looked for and evaluated our students on was their ability to look at a process, a mission, a situation, understand what was going on and figure out how to make things better. You know, just really good problem solving, I guess, is one thing that you could look at it as. Yeah, I think that is really what is at the heart here. You know, at the center of it all, we're looking for officers who are problem solvers and can encourage their people to be problem solvers as well. Yeah, and create a culture of problem solving. I think that's one of the biggest things that we're trying to get out of this. There's, you know, we'll talk about it. There's a time and a place to make things better. But you need to have an attitude of how can this be better? And that culture, it has to be fostered. You can't just say, oh, we care about this. You actually have to put in time and effort and money into making that a reality. Yeah. So really what we're looking for is you know, officers who can think critically, that they're going to, like you said, look at the mission, the process, the set of circumstances, understand the major moving parts recognize strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, assets, and liabilities. We need them to be able to assess the situation and define the problem. What is the problem? What is it that needs to be solved? And then with that information, they're going to work with their people to develop a set of solutions. Then they have to make a decision. Once they've made that decision, or even better, empower their people to make the decision, then they need to act on that decision. The officer has to lead their people through this process of executing the solution, just as they would lead them through executing the mission, making necessary adjustments along the way. Now that goes back to our previous episode on executing the mission, leading airmen and managing resources. It all ties together. It's just one big never ending cycle. And in fact, what is it that I've described here? This is the OODA loop, Colin. Amazing. John Boyd wasn't just blowing smoke. This is actually a real thing. It's not just applicable when you're in a jet flying Mach 3 with your hair on fire. It applies while you are down on the ground at your desk, going about your unit, talking to your people, developing, creating, fostering this culture of innovation. You are using the OODA loop. Yeah. Now, for our audience who may not be familiar with the OODA loop, it's a system 
a way of thinking, a way of problem solving that was developed and made popular by Colonel John Boyd, Air Force legend at this point, where one observes what's going on. They orient. And those are the first two oohs. Observe is, again, gather data, learn. Orient is to adjust and understand the impact of the information coming to you. And then the last two part, the D and the A, decide and act. And this was the problem solving process that I was taught as a student at OTS. We were teaching an eight step problem solving process. Colin, is that what you guys are teaching at ROTC right now? Yeah, we use both. We actually, we teach the OODA loop, the eight step PPSM, practical problem solving method, and also one called AppTech. We don't use it very much. Yeah, which is why I can't remember exactly what AppTech stands for. Yeah, but we teach a method for solving problems. Yeah. And this one has stuck with me the longest, even though I taught the other one for a couple of years. It's UDA to me. That's just what I was taught, what I was raised on, and uh, something I've absolutely used. It's essential that you have a framework for understanding problem solving so that you can get better at it. This is something that we do inherently without really even thinking about it but providing a framework for people to think about it more critically allows them to get better. Where were the places in this process, Colin, that you see people breaking down the most in the OODA loop? Well, let's first take a look at what we're dealing with. So in the observe phase, this is where you're identifying what the problem is. And let's be honest, everybody is really good at identifying what's wrong. There's no shortage of opinions about what is wrong in a Air Force unit at the squadron. Everybody knows what's broken, right? So that's not where things are going to break down because if you know what's wrong, then you can do something about it. It's not in the decide or the act phase because our training as Air Force officers makes us really, really good at making decisions and acting on it. That is something that we train for very specifically to make sure that our officers have the ability to make decisions and act on them. So if it's not in those other three phases, then the whole process has to break down most typically in the orient phase where people are trying to truly assess what's going on, develop solutions that are going to fully address the issue at hand. Why is it that this is the phase that breaks down more than anything else? Well, it's because it takes effort. It takes effort to look at what's going on, think critically about it, fully understand the situation, all the moving parts, all the variables that are involved. It takes time. If you're trying to fully grasp what is going on in a situation, it's going to take time. You have to gather data. You have to make assessments, run surveys, all these things so that you have enough information to help you develop a series of solutions or courses of action that will help you to resolve the problem. And then there's institutional inertia. The way that things have always been done carries some momentum. People don't necessarily like change, especially if the way that things have been done is in their favor. If it's going to change the way that they have to do things, is if it's going to make them feel uncomfortable, then there's going to be resistance against whatever solution you provide, even if it's going to ultimately make things better in the long run. Yeah, I totally agree. Something we would talk about at OTS was getting stuck in the ooh. You know, a little automatopoeia there. It kind of worked really well to describe the student's inability to work through the loop. They'd get stuck in the ooh. It wasn't too often that I knew someone had sorted the observe and orient phase and just were hesitant to make decisions, but that did happen. You know, you'd look them in the eye and you could tell they knew what needed to get done and they understood the importance of doing it but they just needed that little kick to get over the edge. But you're right. We train to that, to the side and act really well. But getting people to go through the ooh effectively and efficiently, that's a real challenge. And I think that there's an opportunity for improvement within our commissioning sources to direct a little bit more attention to getting through the ooh, to working through the orient phase. I don't think that in ROTC, and you may feel the same way about OTS, I don't think that we spend enough time on helping our officers, our cadets, our future officers get really good at critical thinking, gathering data, and developing solutions from that data. Yeah, we focus a lot on it. Just don't think OTS has enough time. Eight weeks just isn't enough time, you know, to get enough reps. But 
it is something we really worked and trained to a lot. So Colin, what's your take on all this? I got to tell you, I get frustrated with change for change's sake. I'm all for making things better. But something I've wondered is if our culture of innovation and improvement creates so much change that we're actually impeding actual mission accomplishment. Have you experienced anything like that? Or am I just totally out in left field here? No, I think you're definitely on the right track here. One of my biggest frustrations as an officer in the Air Force has been that my job, not necessarily my assignment, my assigned unit, but my job changes so frequently. So let me just paint a picture here. When I came into the Air Force back in 2011, my first job was working in a what we call a programming office. I was responsible for developing requirements and projects for the buildup and maintenance of a base. And I did that for about 18 months. My next job was to be the construction management OIC or officer in charge. So no longer focused on the programming of a project, but the actual execution of the project itself. But I did that for only about seven months before I deployed. And I was deployed for six months doing programming again with a little bit of construction management. When I came back, I was a squadron section commander. And I did that for about five months before I was made a flight commander for the readiness and emergency management flight, which I did that for about eight months until I deployed again for another six months being the engineering flight commander. So in my four years as an officer in the Air Force, I had, I lost count, seven different jobs. The longest one that I held was for 18 months, and that was my very first one. And that was because I was learning how to do everything. But after that, I was changing every six, seven, eight months. And that's not uncommon. It is very normal for officers to come in and be moved from job to job to job, even within the same unit. And what that does is it means that by the time that you learn what your job is, but by the time you get good at it, it's time for you to move on to the next one. So there's not really an opportunity for you to optimize anything that's going on because you've just barely learned how everything works. Plus, it also fosters this idea of if you're going to do something, you got to do it quick because you're going to move positions very soon. And so you get in, you take your first quick look at what's going on. You're like, okay, I got to change something so that I can feel like I've done something here in my specific job or responsibility. And I think that continues all the way up through your development as an officer. You know, you get to squadron command and you're in that job for only two years, sometimes only one if you're a deployed squadron commander. And you got to make some changes because that's what you've been raised in. And so I, I totally hear what you're saying here that there's not very much opportunity for optimization of the unit or the mission or the process. But instead, we're focused on some sort of big uh, revolutionaries or sweeping change that can be done as soon as we get our feet wet in whatever job that we're doing. Yeah, I remember one particular experience where the unit I was in was involved in a change that was so drastic that it broke both units that were involved to the point of mission failure. And I understand that sometimes you have to break things in order to build and to change and to go forward, but you have to bring everyone else along with you, right? A single unit is not an entity, an island in and of itself, right? It's connected to other units, which are connected to other units, right? We're all part of this big machine. And we had changed so drastically and so quickly that we didn't bring any of the other units along with us. I mean, it was impossible to. We just changed. And the people that were involved in the process were not involved. It was simply thrust upon them. And we led to mission failure. No joke, mission failure. We had a lot of people leave the Air Force. And pretty soon after the leadership involved in this change turned over, the new leaders came in and kind of saw this flaming dumpster fire of an organization that had been left. And they put things back exactly the way they used to be. And then they apologized out loud. These 206s, like, wow, we're really sorry you guys went through this. That's a really big deal. 
It was. It was. And so I guess, you know, how do we know where those lines are? Because yes, sometimes we do need revolutionary change. We do need to break things in order to really get going in the future. Billy Mitchell, sinking of naval vessels with aircraft. He got essentially court-martialed over that and other related things to his belief that air power was the future and was important. How do we know when we're being a Billy Mitchell and how do we know when we should just sit down, be quiet <laughs> and, you know, and optimize? What are your thoughts on knowing where those lines are? Because as a person going through that experience, it was horrendous. It was violent and uncomfortable and really disenchanting. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's a really tough problem, right? How do we know where those lines are? And, you know, I did a, another interview earlier today but one of the things we talked about that is that sometimes being an officer, it means you have to operate in the gray a lot. There's a lot less black and white. And, you know, I've asked, you know, an 06 mentor of mine, you know, sir, what do you do when you're not really sure what the right thing is? You're doing your best, but you're not really sure. There is no clear, yes, this is right. No, this is wrong. And this is kind of falls into that category for me. And what he said has really stuck with me. He said, if it's repeatable, if it maintains your reputation, if it's reputable and is transparent, if you can do all of those things as you make this decision, then you're probably doing the right thing. If you think about it, if in any way you have to hide what you're doing from either the people involved, from the leadership above or to the side of you, if you have to hide that in any way, you're not being reputable or not being transparent, that's probably not the right thing to do. If you couldn't repeat the same decision, given the same set of circumstances, if you make some sort of exception, you know, to try to treat someone special or something like that, if you can't repeat it, you're probably not doing the right thing. And again, if you're putting the reputation of you or those around you in question, you're probably not doing the right thing. So that was a way to measure, you know, sometimes it's a little simple process improvement. No big deal. Good. Everyone wins. We save some man hours, save some money. Good. But if you're going to have to, you know, really shake things up and it's going to be really challenging and it's going to break some things. And sometimes that's good. If it's repeatable, reputable, and transparent. And if you can have the process be in that place, you're probably doing the right thing. I think that is really excellent advice. I'd never heard it explained that way, but I like it a lot. One of the ways that I typically hear it explained is is the change sustainable? Sustainable is one of those other buzzwords in the Air Force right now that captures this idea of whatever change or improvement is made, can it persist in the long run? Or is it going to revert back to the original state when you, the officer, you, the leader, move on to your next job, as I was describing earlier? So yeah, that idea of sustainability is really important to the Air Force right now. Yeah. One last thing I would put out here as a good way to innovate or to institute change. We're kind of merging two topics, right? You know, change management as well as innovation. But I think they're kind of related. If possible, and as much as you can, you should encourage those that will be affected by the change to be involved in the process. The military is not a democracy, nor should it be. But if you can involve your people in what this change is, it'll make a massive difference. Absolutely massive difference. Seek their input, be willing to implement it. You know, I've had situations where one of my, you know, the favorite flight commanders I've ever worked for had identified something that he felt needed to be fixed. He sought his folks' input. We proposed a solution. He didn't like the solution, but he said, I think that's the best one. I would vote for this one. But the bulk of the people said, no, nah, sir, I think we ought to go with this. He took the risk of implementing that idea. And it worked out really well. And that was hugely influential to me as a follower and as a future leader to see how much humility it takes to sometimes not be right. You know, to have your people involved in that. He recognized he didn't have all the ideas. You know, we are one person, right? Colin, you are one person, I'm one person, but together we can have a much better solution. Another thing to do, if you can, is listen to history. Find a civilian, find maybe an older senior NCO who's been around the block a few times. Maybe this change or this new idea that you've got is just something that's already been done and isn't new at all. And I've avoided a lot of pain that way 
you know, hey, I got this idea. What do you think, chief? Oh, well, sir, that was tried, you know, six years ago. And this is the result that you haven't been thinking about. Oh, you know, that's great stuff. So do you have any other ideas of how you can, you know, involve your people or more effectively manage through change and innovation? Yeah, just real quick. I want to emphasize one thing here about using your people. I think that's one of the reasons why the enlisted tend to stay in an assignment much longer than the officers do. Their responsibility is to be the technical expert in their specific job. And with that responsibility, they stay in their assignments longer than the officer does. Not just in the assignment itself, you know, at a unit in a location, but they don't move jobs like I was describing earlier. They'll be in a shop for two, three, four years at a time getting really, really proficient at that specific job. And so it's critical for you as the officer to engage your enlisted and your civilians, especially your civilians, because they're the institutional knowledge. They're the ones that have been there for 20, 30 years in some instances. They've seen you, that new lieutenant, that bright-eyed, bushy-tailed captain with all the bright ideas. They've seen you before, many times over, which is a good thing. It's a bad thing in other circumstances. But what that means is there's nothing new under the sun. They've seen your idea most likely come through before. So it's really important that you engage them like you were saying, Reed, because your people, your enlisted and your civilian personnel have been in that assignment at that location for a lot longer than you have and will continue to be there after you're gone. Yeah. And I think it's worth mentioning. We are not saying these things in order to squash or, you know, diminish your desire or willingness to bring something up. Please continue to bring it up. We're just trying to point out some ways you can bring it up in an effective way to actually make real change. Because yes, maybe you do have a good idea. Maybe it is new. Maybe it is the first time ever. And I've been parts of those as well. Not my ideas, but been around when those things happened. And yes, so please bring them up, but let's do it in the right way. You know, Colin, as we talk about all this, something that I continue to think about is what does this look like still? I mean, we've talked about a lot of ideas, but I'm wondering how this is going to be captured on a piece of paper. How is this going to be recorded? How is it going to be measured? And I'm not really sure I know. And again, this is one of those, yeah, I'm sure there are people out there with great ideas and I look forward to seeing what the guidance looks like. But what are your thoughts? What is this going to look like on paper as we move forward and with the new evaluation system that's coming probably pretty shortly? Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that I'm sure when the guidance comes out and we get our first look at the new officer evaluation, that's going to help us much better understand and explain to all of you, our audience, how this all is going to work. But here are some of my thoughts. The Air Force always is going to value some sort of metric with regard to the improvement of the unit. Number of dollars saved, number of man hours saved or reduced, performance or equipment efficiency, some sort of metric is going to be a requirement for measuring the improvement of the unit. But I know that that can only go so far because when we're speaking in that regard, we're talking usually in some sort of way that's related to the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You know, what is the technology that we've leveraged? What is the software or information that we've implemented that has caused this money saved, manpower saved, uptick in performance, you know, sortie generation or accuracy of munitions, projection of air power kind of stuff, right? But there are lots of things that the Air Force does that are not very measurable, especially when it comes to human relationships and the morale and welfare of our airmen, of the people that we're trying to lead and take care of. But there is still a lot of innovation that can be done there in improving people's work-life balance, their understanding and motivation toward the mission. I think we can still be innovators there because, again, it's all about problem solving. It's all about identifying what the issue is, coming up with a set of solutions and carrying it out in a way that improves the unit. And I don't know that that's very measurable. Yeah, it's going to be really curious. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. You know, maybe this is going to be a little bit 
intangible and you know maybe it's trying to capture some of those things that we all know what right looks like and i put looks in air quotes maybe this is going to be one of those ways we can tally up what becomes a quote unquote good officer but um i'm really looking forward to it I, this is an exciting time again i do think this captures part of the identity of what it means to be an airman it definitely spoke to me as i was looking at joining the military and joining a service this idea of continuous improvement of getting better of never settling of excellence that absolutely spoke to me when i was thinking about what i wanted to do with my life so pretty exciting about this time and uh i guess we'll just have to look forward to the guidance yeah i wish i had better vision into the pentagon's process and timeline for when that's all going to come out maybe there's somebody out there in our audience or facebook group that can provide a little bit more fidelity a little bit more explanation of how this is all going to break down and we'd love to share it with the rest of our audience well be careful what you wish for colin i don't think you want you know a long-term assignment at the pentagon as a captain (laughs) <laughs> that is certainly true. I, well, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that might work out for me in my family at the moment, but and it would certainly help this podcast move forward. But I also don't want the Pentagon owning the podcast. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure as you know, hopefully potential future FGOs, you know, the Pentagon lies in our future. Well, Reed, I think that has been a good roundup explanation of what it means to improve the unit, even if we're still a little unsure about how it's going to be captured on the future officer performance report. But even so, it is still something that we value. It's something that every officer needs to be a part of, either being the innovator themselves, being the problem solver, or more importantly, fostering that culture and it helping their airmen be problem solvers and taking ownership of improving the unit. We hope that this information has been useful to all of you, our audience, in better understanding what it is that the Air Force values. Again, this has been the fourth value in the list provided by General Godfin in his memo and also that is outlined in AFI 1-2. As a review, we as officers in the Air Force value executing the mission, leading airmen, managing resources, and now improving the unit. Our next episode that will come out next week is going to focus on how all of this is built on top of a foundation of impeccable character. We hope that you will join us for that episode. We hope that you will share this information with others that you think it will be useful to. And here's a little invitation. Help us to improve our podcast. Join our Facebook group. Leave us a rating or review. Send us your comments, your suggestions, your questions to airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com or engage us on the social media. And we will do our best to make this podcast better for you, our listening audience. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. All right, sir. The audience has now had the chance to revisit the episode on improving the unit. They are now anxious to hear from your perspective. Having been a squadron commander, ops group commander, now a sitting wing commander, your understanding of the commander's role and how you go about improving the unit. Yeah, absolutely. I would say for a commander, the role would be to be an empowerer, to empower the units, because you absolutely are not going to have all the answers on how to improve the units. You may have a better understanding at different levels. As a squadron commander, you have a real good feel for just about everything that goes on in your squadron. As a wing commander, there are a lot of things that you don't fully understand because maybe it's not in your career field yeah. or just the enormity of things when you're you know, dealing with you know, 14, 1,500 people or more. There's just a lot that goes on. So making sure that you're airmen feel empowered. If they see an issue, they are willing to speak up and help find a solution for it. Uh, That was my message from the beginning when I took command. We've dubbed ourselves the wing of choice, the 403rd wing. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's been our mantra within the wing. And I told our wing, when you hear wing of choice, I want you to think I have a voice. Okay. That is empowering them. If they see a way that we could do something more efficiently or effectively, 
or a way that we can accelerate change, that they are willing to speak up and bring up their ideas or a way to better equip us or better work as a team, whether it's within the wing or outside the wing with our host wing or across the total force, then I want them to find a way to communicate that. And we try to give them many different ways to communicate, whether it's just through their chain of command, through the Air Force Connect app, we put a you know a button on there that they can give feedback and things like that, a lot of different ways. So yeah. to me, it's taking advantage of that because I sure don't know all the answers and I don't know every way that we can do things and I don't see all the inefficiencies that we have within the wing. So that's one way is to empower. If you look in the AFI, if you look in the 1-2, this portion on improving the unit has a lot of focus on that commander's inspection program and AFIS, the Air Force Inspection System, is kind of the go-to for improving the unit. Yeah, There's a lot of different aspects to it. A lot of folks, when they think about those inspections, they think about MICT. Right. <laughs> and it's just, you know, going through and turning checklist green and calling it good. But there are a lot of ways that a unit can take advantage of those systems in order to make data-driven decisions in order to find out where your risk is, where you're, you know, where you need resources or you lack the right number of airmen in a different situation to get things done. And so uh, taking advantage of those systems that the Air Force has handed us, one, it's a requirement <laughs> yeah, because that culture of compliance is required in the Air Force. We can't just do our jobs. We need to make sure we do it according to the rules and regulations but also it can be used as a forward-looking system in order to make sure that we are doing things the best way that we can. So you brought up MCT, and that's probably the piece of software that most people are familiar with if they've been in the Air Force. I don't even know what MCT stands for. Probably nobody does, but I know what it represents. It's your unit distilled down to a checklist of sorts. All the things that you as the commander are responsible for that need to be assessed on a regular basis. And if they're green, they're good. If they're red, they need attention in order to be improved. So it then harkens back to the point of this episode, improving the unit. But most people who work with McT feel like it's like a ball and chain as opposed to a means for actually improving things. And it makes me think of, are you familiar with Goodhart's Law? When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. That if something is green in MCT, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good thing. It may be that you are doing things correctly according to the process, but what if the process is bad? Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's why it can only be, it just needs to be one portion of this whole process. So to me, a fully green checklist is actually kind of a target. That means either you're not looking at it, you know, fully to really find those nuances of compliance, or you're just kind of happy with it and you're not really paying attention to it, like you said. So yeah, MICT is part of a process that is about self-assessment. And that is the system, the, the AFIS system is we are more looking at ourselves more than that headquarters coming down. You know, For those yeah. of us old enough to remember the ORIs, that was us showing that we can execute the mission and they're coming in to look at us and, and we put on our gas masks and we go somewhere else possibly and, and do all those things and just feel the pain. <laughs> now, the system is about us doing a majority of the work ourselves, yeah. self-assessing, using MICT, using some of the other tools to take a look at ourselves and to kind of utilize those to see where those issues are. And then taking that next step, a lot of wings, a member of our wing staff is in charge of process improvement. And so we find an issue. Now we ourselves can write it up and say, this is a process within our wing that is broken. And even if it's green, even if it's green, now we dive down. And if it's a process that involves multiple units, then we bring a lot of people in. Again, for those of us old enough to remember AFSO 21. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got some scar tissue from that because and here we are in 2022 now. <laughs> <laughs> right. We've got a, you know, some big event that we put together for a whole week or maybe even two. And we've got 
10, 20 people in a room for, you know, going through the sticky notes all over the place. And I even had a few I took part in and we came up with a great solution and we outbriefed the commander and they immediately said, nope, not doing that and move on. And you're just left there feeling empty. Yeah. What was all this time and energy spent for? Like, why did we do this? Right. But now our process improvement professionals are, that's a hard one to say, are trained up to make this so much more efficient. We had one recently, you know, for reserve units, we have lodging challenges because we bring folks in for a drill weekend. So we rely on the local economy to lodge a lot of our folks because we can't put all of them in a single weekend into our on-base lodging. So for us, an issue is those no-shows, the people who make a reservation through our system on the local community and then end up making a different plan for the weekend. So we had that issue within our wing. Too many no-shows because it's costing us money. We're ending up having to pay for the room anyway. So we put together a group that had the experts, basically maybe about eight hours total of work that they put together. They defined the problem. They came up with a goal. This is the number of no-shows we want to have, this number or less. And then they created a glide slope, a time frame. They created a few specific action items, and they outbriefed me within a week. And now we're off and running, and we'll see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll adjust fire and move on from there. Much more efficient, and it's a way that that is also a part of this process, that as soon as you find it, find an issue, roll it into our process improvement office, and then we can move on from there. Yeah, that's a great example. What I want to know, though, if you can, is so you, so the goal is to help your airmen feel like they are empowered. How do you as a commander go about empowering them? And how do you know that they know that they are empowered? Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get that feedback from folks. Some of it is direct. One of my favorite things on a drill weekend is that my command chief and I have lunch with some of the airmen. So we grab an airman from each of the groups and we sit down with them. And a lot of what I do is ask them questions of what I kind of checking to see if what I've told my group commanders, if that message continues on to them. Right. I ask them, Hey, we've got this initiative. Why are we doing this? Or, you know, what do you think about this? And so getting that direct feedback to me is one way. Obviously, we've got the, we call it the DOX, the climate surveys. That is a way to hear from airmen directly on some of the specific issues within the wing. And we do read that. I think there's some negative feeling on some of those surveys, but it really does, especially the stuff that folks write up and put in the comment section as action items directly for us. Also, Basically communicating, it was actually, it was Adam Grant, who is a University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business professor. He came and talked to all the wing commanders in D.C. He wrote a book about changing things. It's called Think Again. And the thing that really stood out that he said to us is, you know, we've got that saying, you know, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Yeah. Which I've always been a, you know, a huge fan of that saying, you know, don't just come to me and regurgitate all the issues that we have, you know, come up with some solutions. But if that's what we say to folks, we are guaranteeing that they will not bring you the hard problems that they don't have <laughs> solutions for. Right. I would rather, you know, hear from somebody, hey, sir, we've got this issue. I'm not sure what we need to do about it, but it's an issue. You know, not sure who even to go to. Okay, let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out. Let's get all the right people in the room and talk through it. So, yeah. And those are the problems that really need our attention. You know, all the easy stuff we've already solved. And if they're bringing you a solution to it, they're just solving it again. Right. Right. And I tell you what, we've got those on top of each other right now, you know, with the COVID challenges, you know, COVID vaccination, some of the budget issues. All those things are all piled on top of each other. Each problem in and of itself is a big challenge. So, Not to mention the threat of near peer competition and needing to shift away from a global war on terror toward a possible fight with a near peer. Yeah. The challenges, like you said, are stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, yeah, there are plenty of times somebody has come to me with something and I've just been like, yep, that is a big challenge. Let's figure it out piece by piece. Again, like, how do you know when the airmen know that they are empowered to work on those big, hairy, audacious, scary problems. Like, what is it that you are looking for? You mentioned those opportunities to sit down and have a meal with the airmen, but what are the uh, indicators 
outside of that that tell you your airmen are doing what you want them to be doing toward improving the unit. Yeah. So for me, it's you've got the systems in place. Like we talked about MICT. If you are seeing red, then you know that they are truly looking at things and they are actually getting to some of the issues that are out there, at least seeing them and bringing them up, maybe not to the point where they've got the the solutions as well. But for me, it also is having them move out with those solutions. You know, they don't need our permission to move forward with a lot of the improvements that they need. Okay. There are a lot of things. It was also actually brought up by a previous commander. The book turned the ship around using the saying, I intend to. I've read the same book. Actually, a previous wing commander gave it out to all the squadron commanders. And that is a way of empowering as well, of making sure that they know to just go forward with things that they have control over that are well within their units. And I've seen that plenty of times as well. Oftentimes, come to me with the solution already in place. You don't even have to bring the solution up to me. If it's already done and you've already worked at your level, anything that can be worked by a squadron commander, I've always said squadron commanders should have the ability to call any other squadron commander within the wing and work through problems. And where you maybe have a difference of opinion, now you bring it up to the next level and it continues to go up. But anything that can be worked at those levels absolutely should be. Yeah. So talking about the different levels, obviously you want every airman from the airman basic all the way up to colonel, such as yourself and general officers. You've probably got a couple on your base. You want them all to feel empowered to make those improvements, to say to themselves and to their commanders, I intend to take these steps. But where is it that you feel that intention to act and improve is best situated and best carried out. Do you want to see it from your squadron commanders? Do you want to see it from junior NCOs? Who do you want to see saying, I intend to take this action? I would say it's absolutely everybody. I want, and this is what we talk about with diversity. You know, there's a lot of different types of diversity. Yeah. And one of them is just a diversity of experience. Mm -hmm. You know, for us aircrew folks, We often brief, it doesn't matter if this is your first time on the plane or you've got thousands and thousands of hours. If you see an issue, please bring it up. Yeah. The worst thing that can happen is it's not an issue and maybe you get ridiculed a little bit, but the best thing is you save the aircraft and save the crew. So that to me can be applied to, you know, anything. If you are new to the wing, if you're brand new to the Air Force, I want you asking the questions of why do we do that? Because the worst answer is because that's the way we've always done it. That's oftentimes a challenge within the reserve where people do stay in place for a long period of time and they just kind of get entrenched in the way they do things. And that just kind of becomes the process as opposed to an actual thought out and defined process. So that's a lot of where we can get at is you know, let's take a look at how we're doing things. Let's bring in people from other wings, whether they're assigned to our unit or we just bring in somebody to take a look at it, how we're doing something and bring in that additional perspective. And, you know, people with different experiences within their career can all give a different opinion on things. And then we figure out the best way to do it and move forward. I agree with you, sir. I think in order to achieve the chief of staff's goal of accelerating change so that we don't lose, that everybody of all ranks at every level, regardless of your position, experience, capability, needs to feel empowered enough to say, I intend to take this action. And it's by the collection of everybody's intentions toward making those improvements that acceleration is actually going to take place. I do feel, though, that maybe the most important place for that empowerment to happen is among those airmen, those ranks that feel stuck because they feel like there's nothing they can do to make things happen. And that typically, that feeling of being stuck usually happens around, you know, the E7, E6, E7, O3, O4, where they've been in the Air Force long enough that they've been beaten against the brick wall of the bureaucracy and policy and all that for long enough that they've just kind of started to submit (laughs) to just accept that things are as they are. Whereas later 
in their career, if they make it to E8, E9, O5, O6, they break out of that a little bit and they're at a position where they can, they have the authority and the experience to affect a little bit more change. So my perspective, and I would appreciate your comments on this, is that really it's those ranks right there, you know, those who have been in the Air Force from six to 15 years that they recognize and feel like they are empowered, that there is a way for them to make changes and that they're not just going to continue to hit that brick wall and see no change at all. Yeah, and that is the challenge that commanders and senior enlisted leaders have is to see those folks and whether it's moving them into a position where their voice can be heard or just kind of going to them directly and getting that opinion from them so that the folks that get to that level can continue to grow. Because, you, yeah, you get stuck for a period of time and then you kind of the momentum ends and it's kind of harder to get those folks going again. So I agree. And so, you know, for a squadron commander, it's keeping your eyes and ears out and empowering your, if you've got a superintendent within your squadron, making sure they are doing the same for those folks that have those thoughts and ideas. And, you know, whether it's pulling them closer to you, making them a, an exec maybe, so that oh, dear. you kind of hear, hear from them. <laughs> it's not the worst. Also, that is another thing that I've done at, at each level within the wing, fortunately or unfortunately. But, you know, it's looking for those opportunities. It's whether you maybe put them in charge of an event or something going on. And a little bit, you're observing them and testing them a little bit, but you're also opening them up to be able to be heard and see their own abilities and that may be just enough if they gain some confidence from that to allow them to kind of break through that barrier. Yeah. Well, sir, there's been some really great conversation here, some great discussion, great examples of how to go about improving the unit, make sure that people feel that empowerment. And if they don't, steps that can be taken in order to give them the voice that you talked about earlier. Now, before we get out of here, what are some final takeaways that you want the audience to know about being a commander, having the responsibility of improving the unit at every level from squadron to group to wing command? What I would say is each command is different and unique. Sometimes mm -hmm. the actions needed to improve the unit are obvious. At my squadron command level, the 815th Airlift Squadron had been on the chopping block for many years, and they were down to about 40% manned when I took command. Only about a third of them were actually fully mission qualified. Oh, wow. It had just been decided that the unit would stay here and it would need to regenerate. So that I was handed an obvious improvement problem there to work through. We had a small group of folks that we would build the squadron upon. But we saw an obvious starting point and an obvious finishing point to get back to fully mission capable and deploy as a TAC airlift unit. So that was a very easy and defined uh, challenge there. Yeah. But sometimes you're given a more challenging problem in that where I am at the wing level here, we've got a wing who is amazing at accomplishing the mission. And we've got a lot of pride in it, and we often hear how good we are at it. <laughs> I mean, the Hurricane Hunter's pretty awesome, right? Right, right. But at the same time, we didn't have a lot of those process improvement functions built into our wing. So we have realized over the last few months that that system is not mixed in with every decision that we make. We're not making those data-driven decisions. We're not taking a close look at the way our processes are run. So, you know, to now get full buy-in from the wing that, hey, we need to make a big shift within the wing, a wing that is succeeding in many different ways, but there are a lot of ways that we can improve. So that is a very different challenge and trying to find that within your units without just making change for change's sake, without just, you know, being that person that's going to make something and then as they give up command, it's going to be, people are going to look the other way because they saw that you just did it just to try to make your mark. Yeah. That's the biggest mistake. Find those actual real changes that you can make that are going to continue on beyond your time and make that a stronger unit moving forward. 
really fantastic advice there. Realize that every command is different. Every unit is different, that there will be opportunities for you to fix the very obvious problems. But the greater challenge will likely be take a unit that's already performing at a higher level and try to improve it for that incremental amount that 10%, that 5%, even that 1% difference. Because if we're not striving towards improvement, then we find ourselves getting complacent and sliding backwards before we even know it. Exactly. Very good, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. This has been instructive. This has been very helpful. If People want to get in touch with you to discuss even further your ideas on improving the unit, what it's been like commanding, both on the active and on the reserve side. Maybe they just want to talk shop about flying the C-130 and tactical airlift. What is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, I'm out on the global. I'm a dot one, but folks can absolutely feel free to email me there or go through you all and, and you can get them in touch with me. Excellent. We will link that in the show notes. And now to conclude, obviously, sir, you are aware of how we like to end our episodes, usually asking about what it means to be an officer. But for our purposes here, we're going to shift that to the question of what does it mean to be a commander? To me, being a commander boils down to a single thing, and it's a part of those major graded areas. But to me, it touches everything. And that is simply taking care of airmen. And that takes on a lot of different things. All the aspects of being a commander to me focuses on those taking care of folks. That could be making sure they have the right resources or like we said, the right processes to do their job. Oftentimes that means taking care of them as a person and taking care of their family, whether deployed or at home. Sometimes it's on the negative side. Sometimes it's taking care of them to make sure that they get back on the right track, Yeah, some disciplinary actions. And oftentimes it's taking care of them to make sure that they know what the next part of their career is and developing them through professional development and things like that. But I have boiled it down in my time in command. I often have somebody who can focus more on the actual accomplishment of the mission, whether that's a director of operations or a deputy ops group commander or a vice wing commander, they can really focus on making sure that we are accomplishing the mission so that I can focus on the people. And I find a lot of joy in that. It's a challenging job. There is new challenges. Any commander will say, you know, you cannot make up the things that we have dealt with and you just never know what each day is going to bring. But that to me is the fun of it. And I absolutely love taking care of airmen. Awesome, sir. Well, Colonel Rubio, this has been awesome. Really enjoyed listening to your perspective. Is there anything else that you want to say to the audience before we wrap up here? Nope. I really enjoy your podcast. It's great to get a lot of information out, both to folks who are looking to get commissioned and those who already are. And I really think you offer a great service to all of your listeners. Well, thank you, sir. We couldn't do it without folks like you. You know, Reed and I have some ideas, but we can only speak so much and so far, especially when it comes to topics such as this and the perspective of command, we have to rely very heavily on people like you. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And we look forward to additional conversations in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. And that will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.